Okay, so not to keep you in any more suspense, I'm so glad that you were able to join us this evening. It isn't raining, um, but this is promising to be a very fine lecture, which we've been anticipating for some time, as we have a bit of a celebrity among us, um, Keith Christensen, who's long been at the Metropolitan Museum of Art, where all of us have admired his work over many, many years now. I'm not sure he wants me to tell you exactly when he joined the Met, which seems like too personal uh, a piece of information, but he's been there for a long time. <laughs> and we know this because we remember so many of the great exhibitions that he has curated. Uh, he is called John Pope Hennessy, Chairman of European Painting, which is a, a very distinguished title indeed, but probably very fitting for someone of such stature in the field. But he's done these great shows on El Greco, on Poussin, on Tiepolo. Um, and he has acquired for the Metropolitan many exciting things, uh, including some upcoming surprises that we're very uh, eager to hear about when it all becomes public. Uh, but the Metropolitan has certainly been very fortunate to enjoy the expertise of such an elegant curator for so many years. And we were thrilled that because of his long friendship with our director, Larry Feinberg, he agreed to haul himself all the way across the country in the middle of a snowstorm to give this lecture. Um, and the topic is really very intriguing. Uh, I actually don't know exactly what he's going to be talking about, but I have an idea that it will be uh, very uh, delightful and based on so many years of long looking at such great masterpieces. So please help me welcome him to the stage. Thanks so much. I, it didn't actually take too much to convince me to, and my, to, and my wife to take a break from New York. Um, we left, we left the, uh, the snow and de-icing of wings last night. And although we didn't get into, we got into the airport at, uh, at LA three hours late at 12.30 at night to wake up with the sun and then come to Santa Barbara and uh, with the ocean. I'm, I'm, I'm a Californian and my wife is a native Californian. So this is, uh, this is terrific. And it's always great to see Larry. Uh, we've, had, we've been uh, great colleagues for a, for a long time and had wonderful discussions about many things. So what I want to talk about today is making connections and um, encourage you for close looking and to find things in pictures that you can hook onto and that take you deeper into the mindset of the artists who made them. The image on the screen is me. I was younger, with more hair, and it was not entirely gray. It was taken 10 years ago when I was on vacation with my wife visiting the pilgrimage church of Birnau on Lake Constance. It's a marvelous sight on the, on the banks of the lake, surrounded with vineyards, and the interior is simply heaven, or at least it's a vision of heaven. The statues in the church are by the remarkable 18th century German sculptor, uh, Josef Anton Feuchtmeier. He's a sculptor that has a special meaning for me because you see among the very first art history books uh, that I was given was the LaRousse Dictionary of Renaissance and Baroque Art. I remember getting it the Christmas, the year that I returned from my junior year abroad in France, and that would be Christmas of 1968. This extraordinary piece of sculpture was on the frontispiece, as you can see, and I remember being completely entranced by it. Each time I pulled out the tome to look up something or read one of the essays it contained, I'd pause for a minute and stare at it. I think it was the extravagant artifice that so enraptured me, that buildup of soft, fleshy forms to create a figure in a dynamic dance-like pose. There's the waving hair and sharp folds of the drapery, the insouciant expression of the cherub figure, finger in his mouth as he tastes the honey he has stolen from the hive. It's like a great statue by Bernini, but with schlag. <laughs> the monastery is Cistercian, and the honey liquor, as he's popularly known, is a cheeky reference to St. Bernard, whose eloquence earned him the name Dr. Mellifluous which, by a wordplay, is turned into the honey-tongued preacher. Pretty cool. Uh, 
Bavarian Rococo is an ideal antidote for me to the stingy aesthetic of Bauhaus modernism, which I view as a sort of return to Cistercian values, but without the visual pleasure of hand-cut stones. And it demonstrates that sometimes less really is less, and more really is more. <laughs> so when my wife and I made our first visit to the Rococo churches of Bavaria, and we've done it three times now, each time visiting different churches, Bernal was a place I had to see. And when we got there, I asked my wife to take that shot of me in front of the puto that had haunted my imagination for so long. That art has this power to haunt us to such a degree that we scheme on ways to see what we have heard about or seen in reproduction or can easily access on the internet is one of those fascinating uh, mysteries. It's a mystery, I think, because it is by no means certain that the thing that haunts me will have the same effect on you. Because in the end, our responses to works of art are complex and personal, and attempts to intellectualize the, proce the process seem to me doomed to failure. A few years ago, my niece was visiting New York from the West Coast, and she asked to go to the Frick Collection with me. I'm sure many of you know the experience of visiting this collection of masterpieces of old master painting formed by Henry Clay Frick. And I just say as a side that Wikipedia succinctly describes him uh, in the most uh, beneficent terms I think you could possibly construe as an American industrialist, financier, union buster, and art patron. I love the way union, I think, I love the way union buster is sort of embedded in all of this benign stuff because it, he was not just a union buster, he was a, he was a killer of workers. <laughs> Uh, no sooner had we entered than she asked to see the Vermeers. She said he was a favorite artist of hers, and she knew the Frick had some paintings by him. So we headed to the main galleries and found ourselves standing in front of the largest of the Frick's three paintings. It shows a, letter receiving, uh, a lady receiving a letter from her maid, and the figures are much larger than was Vermeer's habit. She turned to me and said, So, Uncle Keith, why is this a great picture? It was not intended as a polemical question, just a means of drawing me out. Well, this is a great picture, but it's not one of my favorites. In fact, it has puzzled me for a very long time, precisely because I don't connect with it the way I think I should. So I found myself stumbling. You see, the picture has always struck me as something that would have been much more beautiful and mysterious had it been about a quarter of its size. Put simply, it impresses me as something enlarged beyond its intrinsic scale. That the figures are as large as they are is perhaps a sign of a new ambition on Vermeer's part and a desire to achieve an effect of monumentality, something Vermeer had done early on and, I sort of think, more successfully when he painted quite differently with a denser, more impasto technique that conferred on the figures more physical density and the weight that a larger size requires. At least that's the way my mind works, but remember, I'm an Italophile, so I apply Italian uh, uh, values even when I'm looking at northern paintings. I'm thinking, of, uh, for example, of this work that's in the Metropolitan's collection that was done very early in, in Vermeer's career. The decision on Vermeer's part to return to the scale of this early work at an advanced date in his life could well serve as a subject of an art historical discussion, and indeed, that would be necessary if we are going to move beyond the I like this, I don't like that syndrome. But at the end of the day, you are still left with what it is you like or what you and I look for in Vermeer, what it is we value and what we find tr that is transformative in his art. While I'm always ready to be convinced to another point of view, or at least that's, a, what, that's what I like to think, this work in the Frick simply does not quite do it for me. Though I, each time I go to the Frick, I stand before it and try and connect. What does do it? A picture like this. It's in the Metropolitan Museum's collection. It's a woman with a picture. That sense of a heightened perception of the everyday world the way the seemingly incidental action of this 17th century woman takes on an almost sacramental quality. The geometric forms that create the scaffolding for the composition, the map, 
the window frame, the backrest of the chair, and the table that framed the women's action and that fixes the moment. And note just how important these rectilinears are for throwing into, uh, into relief the curved forms of the woman set in front of them. The diffuse light gives a poetic unity to the room. We feel, or at least I do, that Vermeer has been able miraculously to isolate from the con constant flux of time a stilled moment, analyzing it slowly with a sustained intensity that borders on the mystic. We look with enraptured attention at the way the light filters through the leaded window and plays across the back wall or gives light to the white linen cape and bonnet, which is a miracle of representation. And this rapt description of an inconsequential event by Vermeer has suggested to some scholars an analogy with the 17th century philosopher Benedict de Spinoza and his ideas about the imminence of God in the phenomenon of nature. In short, it's the kind of picture that makes you see the world in a different way. When a curator considers the purchase of a work of art for a museum, it's his or her job always to try and balance a personal response with an awareness of the art historical issues that alone can give us some kind of objectivity. But the element of subjectivity is always there. And it was that aspect that I found difficult to communicate to my, uh, to my niece. So I chose these two works of art, one an 18th century piece of German sculpture, the other a 17th century Dutch painting, and these two incidents as a lead-in to the subject of this lecture, which is about the ways in which we connect with works of art. In the case of the Vermeer, light and geometry are clearly key to my response. But there's a detail in this picture that particularly interests me, because it relates to something that during the past several years I've begun to take notice of and even to document with photographs as I visit museums. It's one of the great things about iPhones is that uh, you don't have to carry a camera around. When you have a revelation, you can record it to, 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 to bring up and think about later. And I have to say that it's gotten me to look at any number of pictures in a completely different way. I'm referring to the reflections that Vermeer paints with such extraordinary beauty on the brass pitcher and charger. There's the reflection of the carpet on the underside of the charger, of the various fabrics reflected on the curved surface of the picture, as well as the reflection of the light from the window, and there's the reflective surface of the water in the charger, because the woman, after all, is preparing for her morning ablutions. Now, these reflections perhaps cause no part particular surprise in an artist such as Vermeer, whose paintings depend strongly on the science of optics. But no less closely studied effects can be found in the work of artists we don't necessarily expect to have been equally engaged with the description of natural phenomenon. <laughs> optics had been at the center of the Renaissance understanding of perspective, and so had the depiction of cast shadows, another thing that has come to fascinate me. The understanding of the refraction of light passing through transparent bodies, a glass or water, greatly advanced in the 17th century through the work of men such as Johannes Kepler, Descartes, Christian Huygens, Robert Hooke, and Sir Isaac Newton. And it's not difficult to find visual analogies in the 17th century that underscore the relationship of art to science. But what interests me is not so much the science of optics, a little aptitude for that, but the way these closely observed and described effects of reflection, refraction, and the projection of shadows are used by audience, by artists, to seduce us, the viewer. In 2008, I curated an exhibition about the landscape paintings by the sublime French painter Nicolas Poussin. One of his finest landscapes, incidentally, is in the Getty Museum. So after I show these works, you might think of making a trip down to the Getty and have another look at it. In the foreground, this picture is not the one, this is in the Louvre. Uh, in the foreground, we see the fourth century Greek cynic philosopher, Diogenes, celebrated for his contempt of riches of worldly honors. With his usual antiquarian precision, Poussin actu uh, ac uh, accurately shows the barefoot man with a staff, 
wearing only a simple cloak without any gar other garment. And at his feet is a discarded drinking cup, and I think you can all see it right down there. The actual incident is, re is told by Diogenes Laertius in his third century Lives of the Eminent Philosophers. At a pool, the cynic philosopher encountered a young man drinking from his hands, and he was taken aback. According to Laertius, Di uh, Diogenes cast his cup away with the words, a child has beaten me in plainness of living. Thus, the picture has as its theme a story about the rejection of luxury and the paring down of existence to essentials. It's kind of a picture for our times. Yet behind this scene, promoting rigorous honesty and simplicity, a path, a curving path, leads the eye back to buildings, one having the sh uh, into a lush, lush landscape. There's a lake with a group of buildings along the, uh, along the edges, one having the shape of a small temple or mausoleum. We see figures resting, a shepherd and his sheep, and there are also bathers in the lake, something of an obsession with Poussin. In the distance, there is a dam over which water flows, and beyond that, a city sited on the side of a hill. To the left, viewed behind some trees, is a large building complex that anyone in the 17th century would have instantly recognized as the monumental niche of Bramante's Belvedere courtyard in the Vatican. It's one of those details that can be viewed either as an anachronism, Poussin introducing a modern building into a scene that took place in the fourth century BC, or, as seems to me most likely, Poussin's acceptance of Bramante's masterpiece as an ideal reconstruction of a classical building. So rich is Poussin's description of the setting that we may wonder about the precise relationship between the figure in the foreground and the landscape in the background, because it's the landscape that seems to assume the dominant position. It's the same sort of thing that we might wonder about in this beautiful landscape by Jacob von Reisdale, uh, of the single figure in the very middle of the picture embedded in such a large landscape. And it makes us think also of the Vermeer. Was Vermeer's woman the subject or an excuse for the, re for the recreation of a moment of heightened perception? Likewise, is Poussin's picture about renunciation or is it more like a visual poem about man and nature? So the reason I've chosen this particular painting by Poussin is in order to demonstrate the complexity of his vision of nature in what, after all, is an imaginary landscape. Because, you see, this seems to me to be a crucial example of the very complex relationship that exists between art and nature and the ways in which our experience of art and nature can overlap in unpredictable ways. I've already touched on the figural action and the way the landscape is populated with everyday activities that give it the quality of wholeness and what a 17th century critic would have termed verisimilitude. Then there is the sky and the treatment of light. Poussin was extraordinarily sensitive to the effects of light and to the times of day. His most trustworthy biographer, André Félibien, who knew the artist personally, comments on the importance of the effects, discussing light and color and the interaction of light on different surfaces. And I quote from him, it's what Monsieur Poussin did not ignore. You can see many of his works in which he was very precise in making these observations. It's true, responds Philippian's imaginary interlocutor whose name is Pamander, nothing is more agreeable than those paintings where one sees water in which as in a mirror, the objects surrounding it are reflected, because these are the charming images made by nature herself when she paints on clear and still water the sky and the earth. So Pomander, in his comment, is employing a common metaphor, art as the mirror of nature and the mirrored surface of the water as the painting done by nature. In Poussin's painting of Diogenes, we have a beautifully described contrast between the reflections on the body of the water in the middle ground and the water in the foreground. The sky is reflected more strongly in the distance, 
where the, light, where the lake is bathed in light than it is in the shadier foreground stream. Yet there is never the slightest doubt that we're dealing with a work of art. This is not photorealism. In the foreground, now we're entering into the part that, that really obsessed me, and da daily I would go and look at this again and again. In the foreground, Poussin gives us a tour de force of observation that is surprising, I think, given the stereotypical distinctions we make between an artist like Vermeer, deeply engrossed in the description of the world around him, and Poussin, who embraced the lost past and the world of myth and of history as, re as it was recreated in his imagination. We know from the reports of contemporaries that Poussin made forays into the countryside where he drew and possibly even made some quick oil sketches. But his work was all done in the studio and was based on contrivance, not the transposition of on-the-spot studies. As our eyes move laterally, left to right, actually right to left across the surface of the still water in the foreground, we pass from the soft light that you see here, where reflections on the surface are combined with rocks visible on the bottom of the riverbed into the dark shadows. And as we do, we can observe the difference in quality and character of reflection and also the increasing transparency of the water as a, as a result of moving into the shadows. There is nothing casual about this. In fact, Philippe Bien assures us that such effects are necessary to the science of art. In one portion of his Conversations of Art, Philippe Bien takes up the matter of refraction and the deformation and enlargement that occur when an object is observed partially submerged in water. And yet, Philippe Bien adds, it's necessary to take into account the nature of the water and its depth because if the water is very clear, as it is in fountains, and is not deep, then it is certain that the apparent enlargement of the object submerged in water will be hardly greater than were one to see the same object out of the water. Well, this is exactly what Poussin has done with the care that Leonardo da Vinci might have envied. Indeed, there's no doubt in my mind that the body of water in the foreground was specifically conceived by Poussin as an excuse to display his knowledge of reflection and refraction and transparency. And once we have focused on this feature, we begin to wonder whether the thing that attracted Poussin to the subject of this picture, Diogenes discarding his drinking cup, was the possibility of showing two figures bent over, drinking, the other observing him, reflected in water, and you can just see their, uh, their, their forms at, at, the, at the edge of the waterbed, and the contrast they make with the dead trunk, tree trunk that casts a shadow into the depths of the crystal clear stream. This is then a picture that is about observation. Observation put to the test, so to speak, by an inquisitive mind and described with haunting precision. And it is a picture about the imagination and the power of the artist to bring the past alive and to give it the complexity of a lived-in experience. I often hear people who don't respond to Poussin's paintings, finding them too abstruse, too far removed from real life. For me, nothing could be further from the truth. Poussin accepted the classical hierarchies of art and firmly believed that the, that great painting was about morally or historically significant events. But this did not preclude an interest in nature and its appearances. What fascinated him was the underlying laws of vision, as in the case of the science of optics. I owe to Poussin's paintings my own growing fascination with reflections. Indeed, on my daily walks to work, I am constantly stopping to stare at the effects of reflections in water. This is a puddle after the rain. I love the, con uh, the contradiction between the flat asphalt the curve of the benches and the mirrored surface of the water in which one sees the trees and the sky. As I walk around the reservoir of Central Park on my way to work each morning, I often find myself stopping enraptured by the effects of reeds hanging over, partly submerged in the water. I owe all that to Poussin and that painting. I suppose it does not seem strange to find acute 
naturalistic observations and works painted in the centuries of the first great age of science, which is the 17th century, the age of, and uh, 17th and 18th century, the age of Newton and of Goethe, with their scientific experiments regarding the, uh, regarding the character of light and color. But the fact is that painters were posing themselves representational problems that began the process of the minute exploration of the world centuries before science was able to explain those laws that lie behind visual experience. And this simple fact has led me to begin compiling images of the effects of light, of reflection, and refraction in paintings that I see in museums uh, that I visit, and when I marvel at the effect they have. So here are some of the examples that I've begun to amass. Far and away the most stunning is Van Eyck's Little Madonna in the Gothic Cathedral. It's the Gemälde Gallery in Berlin. Remember, we're talking about a picture that's this big. Each time I see this picture, I'm stunned by the quality of observation. The dappled light coming through the windows and playing on the floor, and the way one sees the flying buttresses through the windows. I hope you can all make these out. Uh, yes, in, uh, yeah, in, these, in the windows. Beautiful, this looks wow, fantastic. When I was in, or, uh, in the Cathedral of Orléans a few years ago, I looked up, and it was Jan van Eyck's little masterpiece that came to mind. What was this extraordinary artist after? Well, it's been shown that there is probably an allusion to the medieval hymn in which the sunlight passing through glass is a metaphor for the miracle of the incarnation and the belief that after conceiving Jesus, Mary's virginity remained intact. It was a belief that had been treated before in a far more conventional way by having gold ray, whoops, I just did that. We talked about me blocking this out. By, uh, so to get back on, let me just quickly, there we are, no problem. So the gold rays pass into glass, a little painting by Gentile da Fabriano. This is fascinating. The radiance of, uh, of God, the gold passes through the window, the gold rays descend on her womb, and there's the shape of the window on her womb. So it's a perfect symbolic representation of light passing through the glass. The glass remains intact, the light remains intact. Van Eyck transforms the character of symbol by his emphasis on naturalism and observation. I think we can say that in his rendition, the light falling through the window is less a symbol than a simile, something that we might render as follows. Just as when light passes through the glass and its rays illumine with golden radiance the interior of a vaulted church, so the Holy Spirit entered the virgin's womb. That sort of thing. It was in the Renaissance that the poetic properties of painting were asserted. These properties depended on the possibility of suggesting similes and metaphors as powerful as those encountered in literature. Of course, in the most obvious way, Van Eyck's depiction calls attention to his capabilities of vying with nature itself. And this was surely what marked him out as the outstanding painter of the 15th century, both north and south of the Alps. The close observation of nature in Renaissance painting usually has less to do with the creation of a vibrant symbol than a strategy for engaging the viewer. Take, for example, Derek Bouts's beautiful small painting of St. John the Baptist pointing Christ out to a supplicant. Uh, the supplicant must be the, per, uh, must be the person who commissioned the work and who, we may suppose, was named Jan after John the Baptist. A river, the Jordan, separates the two. The separation of a donor from the figure of Christ may in part have something to do with decorum, not putting the contemporary too close to the divinity of Christ. But the river is also essential to the story of the baptism of Christ. What I found spellbinding about uh, when I saw this picture in the Alt Pinakothek in Munich was Bautz's depiction of the water. From the reflective surface in the distance to the transparency we see in the foreground. It is described with an eye almost as keen as Poussin's 
and it has the effect of enhancing the scene as though it were taking place in a real place at a specific time of day. In terms of naturalistic observation, Bouts was way ahead of Piero della Francesca's rendition of the same optical phenomenon in his great baptism in the National Gallery in London. Unfortunately, we cannot fully appreciate what Piero intended because the effect he strove for is compromised by the abraded state of the picture. Its surface has been vastly overcleaned, and the details have been lost. Were it not for the fact that one can just make out the water pooled around Christ's ankles, and I don't know that you can actually see it here, but there's a little line of water around their ankles. So what we are actually seeing here, or what he intended us to see, was the riverbed through the clarity of the water where the reflection stops and transparency begins. It would be unclear that there was any water in the bed of river since one seems to see the rocks of a dried out riverbed. He had intended the effect to be that of looking through the surface of the water. As one very astute art historian has shown, in the abrupt transition between reflective surface and transparency, Piero has given us a demonstration of Euclid's laws of optics. By contrast, Bouts, with his far more gradated depiction, gives us his personal observation of a visual phenomenon. So we have two artists showing the same phenomenon. Whoops. Two artists showing the same phenomenon, but one adapting what he sees to fit with an explanation derived from Greek science, that's Piero, the other transcribing what he's actually observed. Each, of course, was striving for pictorial unity in their landscapes, and each has a very different approach to the whole issue of representation. Piero's water is still, and the reflections reinforce the geometry of the landscape with its emphatic perspective organization of space. One of the phenomena that Philippe commented on in the quote I read a bit earlier was the issue of refraction. What happens when light passes through a glass or glass-filled water and the distortion that is encountered when we view an object immersed in water? I downloaded these from, an, uh, from, uh, from, uh, from the internet about refraction and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and reflection. It's something we perhaps don't pay close enough attention to in painting, accustomed as we are, have become to thinking of painting as an imaginative abstracting process. But of course, an artist of the intellectual caliber of Jacques-Louis David could hardly omit giving the effect, uh, paying attention to the effects of refraction uh, in his portrait of Antoine uh, Laurent Lavoisier and his wife, one of the greatest masterpieces in the Metropolitan's collection. For how could you paint a portrait of one of the leading scientists of the day without paying equally close attention to basic questions relating to optics? especially when the refractive power of various gases was being carefully documented by the sitter of that portrait. In this image, we have not only the distortion of the green box seen through the glass vessel on the right, but the reflection on the curved surface of the largest of the glass receptacles of, uh, of the paper and the ink with, uh, with feather, inkwell with feathers. And yet, unless I am much mistaken, there are two modes of vision at work in the portrait. One is applied to the objects on the table, which have been scrupulously studied under specific lighting conditions with acute attention paid to reflections and refraction. The other is an ennobling style that flatters the sitters and transforms them into an ideal couple without compromising what was always considered a key issue of art, the term I've mentioned before, verisimilitude. And I want just to remind you that in the 16th, 17th, 18th century, verisimilitude did not imply realism. It had to do with an overall unity of effect used to suggest an ennobled and elevated view of reality. This employment of two differentiated modes of description was far more evident during the Renaissance when degrees of realism varied depending upon whether the object being described was human or animal, floral or inanimate. This detail of a glass of water with a citrus stem in it 
seems almost a scientific illustration, but it's a detail from an allegory that appears on the reverse side of a portrait and is sometimes attributed to the Venetian painter Jacopo di Barbari. The picture show, uh, shows an allegory of lovers, and I think that this example uh, makes it absolutely clear just how the matter of what we would call realism is adjusted by a hierarchy of values, for the realism of the glass has little to do with the style of the figures. Jacopo di Barbari, incidentally, is the author of one of the most fascinating still lives of the Renaissance, in which the reflections and a meticulous attention to light and shadows plays an essential part in creating an astonishing trompe l'oeil. It is indeed one of the earliest trompe l'oeils in Western art, 1506. Uh, and uh, uh, it, whether we don't know how it was used, whether it was hung so that it actually looked like a wood panel on a wall, whether it was framed, we have no idea, whatever. Here's an art historical comment on the side. At an early point in his career, Jacopo di Barbari left Venice and traveled to Germany, and there he met up with Albrecht Dürer. We know that Jacopo was secretive about informing Dürer about his study of proportions that govern ideally beautiful figures, but the two artists certainly had a common interest in perspective and in cast shadows. Dürer was to write a treatise on the projection of cast shadows. So in the Metropolitan's painting of Christ as the Savior of the World by Dürer, the Salvator Mundi, Dürer shows us a crystal orb through which the robe of Christ is seen. Alas, as you can see from the image on the screen, the picture was in part left unfinished and in part was overcleaned at some past moment. But I'm confident that were the picture not so badly abraded, we would see a meticulous description of reflections on the surface of the, of the robe as well as distortions through, uh, through it. The matter of refraction and shadows appears even in the work of an artist we don't think of as interested in optical theory or even the intricacies of perspective. And that artist that I have in mind is Filippo Lippi, a painter of the imagination who set the stage for the even more radical artifice of Botticelli, who was his prize pupil. I know of no painting in which this intentional dichotomy between observation and fantasy coexists to equal degree as, as Filippo Lippi's beautiful Annunciation in the Alt Pinakothek in Munich. We know, about, we know a good deal about this picture. It was painted for a convent of cloistered nuns in the mid-1440s. The, the style could hardly be more elegantly unrealistic with attenuated figures standing in a curiously inconsistently projected space. And yet on the ledge of the Virgin's prie dieu, there sits a glass vase half filled with water containing roses. It's meticulously observed and beautifully rendered without miraculously creating an anachronistic intrusion. The way that the vase is set in the foreground is not casual. The vase serves as a mediator between the world we live in and the fictional world that the artist has created. It is, in other words, part of Lippi's strategy for engaging us more deeply in the story he tells. And I, and I like to think of the effect of this detail uh, and, the, and uh, the effect it had on the cloistered nuns when, on the altar, in front of the altarpiece, they placed gla uh, glass vases of real roses as they most certainly did on feast days. They would then have made this connection between the two. Another artist who uses this same device to a similar end, but in a very different context, is Giovanni Bellini. In one of his last, and for me, one of his most haunting paintings, it's The Drunkenness of Noah, with two of Noah's sons dec uh, decorously covering his nakedness, while the third, Ham, famously looks on taking amusement at the sight of his exposed father, and thus earning Noah's curse. The picture is in Besançon, and when I saw it recently in an exhibition in London, what astonished me was Bellini's extraordinary idea of putting right close to the picture plane an arresting still life of a cup with wine in it. I assume it's wine, though it actually looks more like water. The cup is tilted, and the wine laps against the edge, its surface a perfect study of stilled reflection and refraction. The effect is simply haunting, 
almost surreal in character. Of course, Bellini has integrated this detail into the overall style of the painting, and to demonstrate this, we have only to compare his cup of water with a dazzling tour de force detail from a still life by a 17th century Dutch painter, Cornelius Delft. I have to say that I know absolutely nothing about this artist. Uh, when I came upon this picture in the Altpinagothek in Munich, I simply was, take, was blown away by, the, by its extraordinary character. Uh, the, uh, the guide to the, uh, to the Munich gallery simply says, Delft reveals a great fondness for painting copper and brass vessels. Well, they got that part right. <laughs> but how inappropriate and intrusive this type of realism would have been in Bellini's painting. And that's what I mean about this negotiation between observation and artistry. You see, there are levels of realism, and they do not necessarily define levels of observation, but rather reflect artistic intention. Like Poussin, Peter Paul Rubens uses a mastery of reflection and refraction to enhance the effect of his painting of the death of Seneca in the Alt Pinakothek in Munich. And I'm sorry for so many pictures in the Alt Pinakothek in Munich. It simply is a museum I absolutely put top on my list of, uh, of museums to visit. As my wife knows, once we enter in, we're not going to leave until the end of the day. <laughs> as with Poussin, the detail can almost be isolated as an independent study. Indeed, I have no doubt that the viewers for whom this picture was intended all commented on the representation of the brass tub with water, just as Philibien did in Poussin's painting, because these artists had very uh, intellectually engaged, scientifically informed viewers. And how about this marvelous detail of a glass vial of what I imagine is perfume? It's a detail from Rubens' wonderful depiction of Susanna and the elders. Once again, it's the observation of that little detail that pulls us into the picture. You know, we've become so used to thinking of details such as the ones I've been showing as part of the 19th century that we forget that this power of observation was always there, at least from the 15th century onwards. Take, for example, this dazzling work by Manet in which, as in a photograph, there's a sharper and a less sharp fo focus depending upon the distance of the figures from the foreground. Although the brushwork is aggressively broad throughout, it is used for different descriptive purposes. Here's the still life detail from this marvelous painting. It literally takes your breath away when you stand before it. Now, just to remind you that Manet was not completely novel in this observation, I want to show as a point of, of comparison a Nibale Caracci's painting of a boy drinking painted around 1582 or 1583. It's scarcely a less astonishing uh, of, a feat for the directness with which it conveys the act of observation. And here I want to remind you not only the, the window reflected in the surface, the, uh, the fingers reflected at the bottom part of the vase, but the light passing through this reflected on the white shirt. As for boldness of technique, I think the Metropolitan Museum's wonderful painting by Nibali Karachi of two children teasing a cat shows that when he wanted to, and when he thought the subject allowed it, which is to say a low-life subject, when realism was more applicable, Anibale could be as bold in his brushwork as Manet was, conveying a sense of immediacy and of movement. In the work of these artists, everyday life was understood to be the raw material from which the fiction of art was created. The fiction of art. These distinctions were already made by Aristotle in his treatise on poetry, The Poetics. Aristotle noted, for example, that, quote, the painter Polygnotus represented men as better than life, Pauson represented them as worse, and Dionysius made them like life. So fascinating that already in antiquity there were these different distinctions between degrees of realism. Obviously, Aristotle adds, these differences also occur in each of the kinds of imitation. Well, these distinctions were embraced by Renaissance artists, and they lie behind the notion of an idealist style, a comedic style, and a realist style. And these are three categories that we read about from the 16th, 17th, and 18th centuries. 
These different styles were applied to the depiction of religious themes and mythology for which the idealist style was thought appropriate. By contrast, a more realistic style was deemed proper for genre paintings, such as Anibale's Boy Drinking, or for portraiture, or for still life painting. Aristotle also made uh, another distinction of crucial importance for the history of Renaissance and of post-Renaissance painting. And that's the distinction between poetry and the writing of history. Poetry, wrote Aristotle, deals with general truths. History with specific events. The historian relates what happened, the poet what might happen. Every painter of the Renaissance realized that this distinction applied as well to a high and a low style, an idealizing one and a realistic one. Michelangelo, for example, practiced a high poetic style. So allow me before moving on to give one other example of the reflections used to engage the viewers. What I have in mind is not the famous mirror in Jan van Eyck's Arnold Feeney portrait in the National Gallery in London, but this little devotional diptych by Hans Memling. Once again, it's in the Alt Pinakothek in Munich. On the left side is the Madonna and child with music-making angels seated in a flowering garden, the enclosed garden derived from the Song of Solomon. On the right is St. George, who presents the donor to the Madonna. The saintly soldier is dressed in 15th century armor, and on his breastplate is a reflection of the figures grouped before him. The reflection has been carefully calculated. We see the back of the head of the donor, as well as the Madonna and two of the angels. There is also the group of trees that appears near the city. But instead of the city, we see a church with its massive tower something we don't see in the background landscape because it's out of our range of vision. But in actuality, it would be visible on the curved surface of the armor. Memling has used the armor not only to enhance the verisimilitude of the paint picture, but to enrich the scene by showing something we can only see thanks to his art. It's quite extraordinary. It reminded me of this stern portrait by the gifted female painter from Milan, Fede Galizia, of Paolo Marigia, a member of the religious order of the Gesuati and a prolific writer. Marigia was 70 when this portrait was painted, and he holds the glasses he needs when writing. Fede Galizia saw her chance. She has used these as an opportunity to situate him precisely in the room where he is working. She shows the window that illuminates the room seen from two angles in the two lenses and not omitting the reflection on the surface of the glass. In his depiction of St. Michael and St. Francis from an altarpiece from Palencia Cathedral, Juan de Flandre uses the shield of St. Michael to show something we would once again otherwise not be able to see except by its reflection. It's a city. The reflection has sometimes been described as a city on fire or with smoke rising from its walls, but I believe that what we see is part of the apocalyptic vision described in the book of Revelations. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven with the key of the abyss and a great chain in his hands. He seized the dragon, that, the serp that serpent of old, the devil or Satan, and chained him up for a thousand years. And that is, of course, what St. Michael is doing in the picture. And then farther along, we read this. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had vanished, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city of Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God, made ready like a bride adorned for her husband. Here then, Juan's knowledge of reflections greatly enriches the storyline. He uses the reflection to assert the eschatology or visionary meaning of the picture. I've spoken about the various ways artists so often place these closely observed still life details in the foreground, up close to the viewer, as a sort of mediator between the world we inhabit and the artistic fiction. Rarely does this strategy of placing a carefully observed object in the foreground have quite the effect it does as in Hugo van der Rohe's overwhelmingly great Adoration of the Magi in Berlin. Incidentally, the picture, is, as you see it, is in its original frame, and these are the hinges on both sides where there were folding wings 
that, clo that uh, closed it most of the time. This is a painting before which I have stood absolutely spellbound. I looked up the notes I took in 2009 because I have it when I stand in front of a picture and find myself completely captivated. I think I really want to write down what I'm thinking right now so I can reflect on it later on. 2009. The effect of having the wings of the altarpiece, which are now lost, swung open to reveal this center panel must have been overwhelming for contemporary viewers standing or kneeling before the altar on which it stood. Hugo places rocks and plants in the right foreground, and the still life of the hat and gift of the kneeling magus in the center foreground to assert the event he depicts as real and momentary, because the poses of the figures are conceived to suggest a moment into which we have intruded. The sacred past is suddenly physically present. And note here the ways in which all the figures are shown advancing doffing a hat, their hands raised, frozen moment. Curiously, the strategy of Hugo van der Goes in his great 15th century altarpiece has a parallel in the work of an artist who is in most respects utterly unlike him, except, I should say, in their intensely interior spiritual life. That's one of my favorite artists, Federico Barocci of Urbino, who painted this work over a century later. What for me is the most haunting example of Barocci's approach is this picture that you see on the screen that's in the Prado in Madrid. For me, it's one of the great masterpieces of early Baroque art, even though uh, 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 it was painted by an artist who normally is thought uh, to, uh, to have painted before the advent of Baroque painting. The subject is conventional enough, Christ on the cross, but the picture is conceived in a very remarkable way. The cross, as you can see, is wedged between the frame and a rocky outcrop just beyond the picture plane, so that the heavily grained wood has an almost oppressively tactile quality. And the viewer is brought into an almost uncomfortable proximity. Christ's loincloth is animated as though a mystic wind were blowing, and dark clouds have gathered in the sky, increasing the sense of an ominous moment. Christ is shown alive, uttering his last words before his death, when we are told in the gospel, there was darkness over all the land. Behind the cross is a path. It descends into the city and then out into an extensive landscape. The city is not Jerusalem, as one might expect, but Barocci's own native Urbino. Indeed, the artist's house was and still is in the area below and to the left. In other words, if you go down that hill, right around the corner is Barocci's house. Across the depression, all visitors to Urbino are familiar with, rises the famous Ducal Palace, dominated by its twin towers and superimposed loggias. We can see that some of the rooms are lit. Life is going on. And then, in the distance, total silence dominates, as though the world were unaware of the momentous event in the foreground. It's a haunting effect, for we are invited to reflect on the moment depicted and its temporal incongruities, an intersection of past and present in the mind of the viewer, a momentous occasion that passes unobserved by everyone except us standing in front of the picture. So this reflection brings me back to where I began this talk, with the very personal responses we have to works of art, the way life and art can inform each other. Let me take an example of this, as an example of this, one of the most famous paintings in the Metropolitan Museum, El Greco's View of Toledo. I really wonder if any other painting has had a like impact on the way millions of people anticipate seeing the city as it first comes into view, as one rides or walks from the train station to the bridge that crosses the Tagus River into the city. We almost hope that it will not be a placid day and that stormy clouds will, uh, will magically confer on that first view the spiritual drama we have come to associate rightly or wrongly with the city. We search for the place from which we imagine El Greco must have taken his view. Perhaps only then 
realizing that the picture was not done on plein air and was never intended to be topographical. The cathedral has been incorrectly placed. Many buildings are left out, while others are added. The landscape has been arbitrarily modified to allow the, a view of the Roman Alcantara Bridge. And at the far left, a group of buildings, possibly the Alliance Monastery, has been flown in on a cloud. <laughs> Precisely because of its emblematic character, of its selective depiction of the most memorable aspects of the city, it captures our memory of Toledo as no topographical view could. And thus this picture forms our notion of the city itself. Artistic fiction trumps reality. Or as Aristotle would say, the poetic truth triumphs over the more mundane historical reality. Which is why I suppose the picture made such a deep impression on the great 20th century poet Rainier Maria Rilke when he saw it exhibited at the Salon d'Automne in Paris in October of 1908. That was before the Havemeyers bought it and gave it to the Met. When he returned to his rooms, he wrote his response to his friend, the sculptor Rodin. It's in a form that El Greco himself, I think, would have approved, since it is, in essence, what is called an ekphrasis, a piece of descriptive poetry meant to capture the character of the work being described. And I'd like to read that. To Auguste Rodin, 77, Rue de Varennes, Paris, October 16, 1908. I am just back from the Salon, where I spent an hour before Greco's Toledo. This landscape seems to me more and more astonishing. I must describe it to you as I saw it. Here it is. The storm has burst and is falling violently behind a city which, on the slope of a hill, climbs hastily up towards its cathedral and, in, and on higher toward, towards its fortress, square and massive. A light, all in tatters, is belaboring the earth, stirring it, ripping it, and making the pale green fields behind the trees stand out here and there like sleepless hours. A narrow river issues motionless from the pile of hills and terribly menaces with its black and nocturnal blue the green flames of the bushes. The startled and a frightened city rises in a last effort as though to pierce the anguish of the atmosphere. One should have dreams like that. Perhaps I am mistaken in clinging with a certain vehemence to this painting. You will tell me when you have seen it. Obviously, the strength of Rilke's response to the painting was personal. Seven years later, he spent a month in Toledo. And in his study of the poet, Daniel Joseph Polakoff has written... Toledo became for Rilke a rich, symbolic image, a topos experienced less as a historical place than as a visionary painting. In other words, the actual city was experienced through the effect of the work of art. The picture also made a strong impression on the astonishing collector and one of the greatest benefactors of the Metropolitan Museum, Louisine Havemeyer. She first saw the picture in 1901 when she visited the city with her husband and her guide, Mary Cassatt. Amazingly, it still belonged to the same family that had owned it since the early 17th century and for whom El Greco presumably had painted it. She bought the picture eight years later, a year after the, after the Salon showing that I just read. She bought the picture eight years later at Durand Ruel in Paris, Gallery in Paris, and it was given to the Metropolitan Museum in 1929. As one might imagine, the picture completely conditioned her responses to the city, which she records in her memoirs. And here, here I'm reading from those. The high wind clouds gathered and rolled over the lofty city and darkened the Alcazar, making its outline sharp as a silhouette against the sky. Toledo looked to me just as it did in El Greco's time when he painted his only landscape, which we own, which is called Just Toledo. It's the joys of possession. <laughs> it's just fantastic. She knows she can return and renew this experience again and again, which is the pleasure of museums. El Greco's painting has actually had a curious effect on me, so that walking home from work, as a storm was descending, I looked up at the sky at Broadway and 103rd Street and had my El Greco epiphany. <laughs> you see, art and life really do intersect in the most unexpected and even, I suppose, trivial ways. I've not only had my El Greco moments, I've had my Tiepolo ones. <laughs> 
Who would have thought, who would have thought that Tiepolo's clouds, the abstract architecture he uses to create uh, an active and deeply layered space inhabited by the gods of Olympus could unexpectedly reform on my way home. It reminded me that Tiepolo was as keen a student of nature and studied clouds as intensely as Constable. He simply used that experience towards an end different from that of a landscape painter. He created pictures that both connect with our experience and yet take us into the realm of pure imagination. And he bequeathed this phenomenal ability to the great Austrian artist, Franz Anton Malperch, whose monochrome oil sketch for the ceiling of the Cathedral of Gior, midway between Vienna and Budapest, I was able to obtain for the Met in 2007. I trust it was not exclusively my love for, the, uh, for clouds that, uh, that impelled me to present this to the trustees in acquisition, but it's an extraordinary exercise in space through the configuration of clouds, I think. And I, standing before it, it still gives me exhilaration. So I want to end this rather meandering lecture, intentionally meandering, I want to say, by reference to a painting that we acquired for the Met a few years ago. It's a picture that brings into play the things I have been talking about, closely observed details, the studied effects of light, and the transformative character of a deeply poetic imagination. The painting is by one of the most original geniuses of British painting, Joseph Wright of Derby. It's a moonlit night in late September, the anniversary of the dream of the, great, uh, of, of, of the death of the great Roman poet Virgil. He was said to have been buried in a grotto about two miles outside Naples, and this grotto was later the property of one Silius Italicus, a Roman consul who, like Virgil, was an epic poet. Silius adapted the custom of visiting the grotto on the anniversary of Virgil's death and of reading there one of the poems from Virgil that form part of Virgil's legacy, those works that have had an incalculable impact on Western culture. Like many British tourists on the Grand, uh, grand Tour, Wright of Derby visited Naples, and he obviously made some drawings of the tomb. But he also employed other visual records of it to create a memory image, something that would register stronger in the imagination than a mere on-the-spot depiction. And to demonstrate this, we have, uh, we can, uh, we have uh, to look no further than a small oil sketch, also in the Metropolitan's collection, around the precincts of the tomb. It's by Franz Ludwig Cattell, uh, and it draws out the contrast between paintings that have the object of recording a specific place and a work of art that uses a place to construct something more complex. Wright had a neighbor whose name was William Whitehurst, and he was a pioneering geologist. And the landscape in his painting of Virgil's tomb clearly incorporates his study of the rock strata to which Whitehurst had drawn Wright's attention at a place called Matlock. Wright painted Matlock Tour by moonlight, thereby combining geological interests in rocks and the Earth's formation with the poetic associations of moonlight. To achieve an effect of sublimity, Wright cast his scene of Silius Italicus' pilgrimage to Virgil's tomb with the cold, silvery light of the moon playing on the rocks. Standing before the picture, we can recreate in our mind Silius' footsteps as he moved past the rocky outcrop with a willowy tree that seems suggestive, suggestively appropriate for mourning. His pilgrimage took him down the worn steps, past the damp, cool, cold shadow in front of the grotto, and into its chilly interior. Silius has set down his lantern just inside the opening, where, it is, where its warm glow colors the pebbled floor of the grotto. We seem almost to hear Silius' voice before we see him within the grotto, absorbed in his reading, his hand outstretched as he declaims Virgil's verses. Wright's picture would not have the effect it does on us were it not for the artist's geological interests and his detailed study of clouds and the effects of moonlight playing through, the, through and on them.
It's one of those pictures in which the subjective response of someone like me who recalls the magic of moonlight, moonlit nights in the Italian countryside intersects with the historical significance and aesthetic, and aesthetic achievement of the artist. This highly romantic picture was painted in 1779, which is well before Wordsworth, Shelley, and Keats had written the poems that now form the lens through which we see the picture. It's another one of those works of art that's in, that invites us to discover something deeply familiar and personal, yet hauntingly strange and new. The kind of experience that, at least for me and I hope for you too, makes visiting museums such an enriching experience. And thank you very much. And I'm told, yeah, if anybody has any questions, I'm happy to try to answer them. Nope, great. Thank you all very much for your patience. Thank you.